Okay, today we're gonna to prove something that I'm gonna call the easiest prime number theorem. But before we do that, I'd like to recall some results that are closer to the actual prime number theorem. And so in order to do that, we need a certain function called the prime counting function. And that's denoted by pi. And how it's defined is that pi of x, for some real number x, is the number of primes that is less than or equal to x. And just as a simple example, notice that pi of 20 is equal to 8. Because you can pretty easily write down all 8 primes that are less than 20. And then the simplest version of the prime number theorem says that asymptotically, in other words for very large values of x, pi of x grows similar to the function x over the natural log of x. But this can be made more precise by saying that the limit as x goes to infinity of the quotient of those two functions is equal to 1. But this x over the natural log of x can indeed be replaced with another function that matches the growth a little bit better. And that's called the logarithmic integral. I think I've done some videos on the channel before about the logarithmic integral. And it's denoted by Lix, capital L, lowercase li is something else. And it is the integral from 2 to x of dt over the natural log of t. So 1 over the natural log of t is not an elementary function. And that's why this doesn't integrate out to something that's more familiar. This function has to be defined in terms of this integral. And what we have is that pi of x grows asymptotically like this li of x. And again, by that we mean that the limit as x goes to infinity of their quotient is 1. Okay, so next up I'd like to talk about a little bit of a generalization of that, and that's going to require something called Dirichlet's theorem. And we've proven special cases of Dirichlet's theorem on the channel before. And that says if you've got relatively prime natural numbers a and b, then there are infinitely many primes of the form a n plus b. And now if we define pi sub a b of x to be all primes of the form a n plus b that are less than or equal to x, then there's this nice result that pi a b of x grows at the same rate as li of x over phi of x, where phi is Euler's totient function. Let's recall that that counts the number of numbers relatively prime to a that are less than or equal to a. And before we get to our result for this video, this simplest or easiest prime number theorem, I'd like to mention that these proofs are really hard and they would take lots of push in the direction of something called analytic number theory. In fact, I think we'd have to do several videos just to like motivate all of the parts. Perhaps that would be a project for the second channel. Okay, so now let's look at what we'll prove. Okay, so for our result, we're gonna need two objects or two sequences. One will be the sequence of all prime numbers and I'll call that p sub n, so that's the nth prime number. So notice p sub one is two, p sub two is three, p sub three is five, so on and so forth. And then we'll define the nth Fermat number. So I've proven something on the channel before about prime numbers and the Fermat number if you wanna check that out. And so f sub n is equal to 2 to the 2 to the n plus 1. So notice that's a very, very, very large number if n has any size at all. And our proposition is that the n plus first prime number is less than or equal to the nth Fermat number. But in terms of our prime counting function, that says that pi of f sub n in other words, the number of primes that are less than or equal to the nth Fermat number is bigger than or equal to n plus 1. But in all actuality, it is much bigger. But that being said, we're looking for something that can be proven using elementary methods, unlike the prime number theorem. Okay, so in order to get started, we're going to need two lemmas. So our first one will be that the n plus first prime is less than or equal to the product of the first n primes plus 1. Okay, so let's see how we, how we might do this. 
So let's maybe set n equal to p1, p2, all the way up to p sub n plus one. And now let's notice that uh, for i between one and n, p sub i does not divide n. Okay, so that means that none of the first n primes can divide n. But how do we know that for sure? Well, we can do a quick contradictory proof if we wanted to. So by way of contradiction, suppose that pi does divide n. But notice that means that pi divide <laughs> <coughs> divides n minus the product from p1 to pn. Well, that's because p, pi definitely divides this product as it's one of the members of that product. Oh, but that difference is equal to one. So we have pi divides one, which tells us that pi, <coughs> which tells us that pi is equal to one, but that's our contradiction because one is not a prime number. It's a so-called unit. So in the general study of prime numbers and irreducibles and stuff, there are three types of objects, units, prime numbers, and composite numbers. So prime numbers and composite numbers are probably familiar, but units are everything that has a multiplicative inverse. So inside of the inter... <coughs> <coughs> So inside of the integers, that's just plus and minus one. So it's not so interesting within the integers. And that's why it seems like one is this strange number and maybe it should be prime, but it shouldn't. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, pi doesn't divide in. That means that there must be another prime that divides in. So there must be a prime, <coughs> a prime that's not on this list but if it's not on this list, it's not one of the first n primes. But if it's not one of the first n primes, then it's the n plus first prime, the n plus second prime, the n plus third prime, so on and so forth. So in other words, a prime of the form p sub n plus k, such that p sub n plus k divides n. Oh, but let's quickly notice that if p sub n plus k divides n, then that means that p sub n plus k is in fact less than or equal to n. If you're divisible by a number, then you must be bigger than or equal to that number. Okay, but now we can pretty much let it rip. Since these primes are in order, we know that p sub n plus one must be less than or equal to p sub n plus k, which in turn is less than or equal to n, which is equal to, just as a reminder, that product p1 to pn plus one. And you know, while I'm at it, I'd like to point out that here, we take k to be bigger than or equal to one. k cannot be equal to zero because that would be a prime on our list right there. Okay, and that finishes this proof if we read this inequality from the beginning to the end. Okay, so we've got this taken care of. And now we're gonna move on to our second lemma which says that the n plus first Fermat number is the product of, well, the zeroth up to the nth plus two. Okay, so how might we prove this? Well, we're gonna do it by induction. And I think maybe it's pretty clear that induction would be a good tool here given that these are indexed. Okay, so let's see how this might go. So we of course need to start with the base case. And so the base case will be what? Well, I think n equals zero will be a nice base case, but that should be just a simple calculation. Notice that f of one is most definitely equal to two to the two to the one plus one. That's the definition of f sub one, but then that'll be equal to two to the two, which is four plus one. But now that's clearly equal to five, and then I'm gonna rewrite five a different way. I'm gonna rewrite it as two plus one plus two. But then this two can be rewritten as two to the one. But then that one in the exponent can be written as two to the zero. 
But now the stuff that I have right here that are in these yellow parentheses now is exactly F sub zero plus two. Okay, so that means our base case is taken care of. And now let's do our induction step. So let's suppose for some k bigger than or equal to zero, we have the result. In other words, we have f sub k plus one equals f sub zero times f sub one up to f sub k plus two. Okay, nice. But now I'm gonna start with, you know, the thing that I'm trying to get at on the right-hand side. So let's do that. So now let's consider, like I said, the following object which starts on the right-hand side of this. So this will be f sub zero times f sub one all the way up to f sub k times f sub k plus one plus two. So there we've got it, it's got everything from, <clears throat> so it's extended the product a little bit. Okay, good. But now I'll look at this grouping right here of the first k for ma numbers, and I'll invert this equation to solve for that product. So clearly we have the product f zero to f k is f k plus one minus two, like that. So let's replace that. So here we have this is f k plus one minus two. I'm gonna put those in the same orange parentheses. And then we have f k plus one plus two. But now I'll just move some things around and I'll see that we get f sub k plus one squared minus two f sub k plus one. And then I'm gonna re rewrite that two as one plus one. But now we've got something that suspiciously looks like a squared binomial. I'll put it in these yellow parentheses. We have something squared minus two times something plus one. To me, that looks like f sub k plus one minus one quantity squared. And I'll put that in the same yellow parentheses so we can see where that's coming from. Oh, but now let's go over here to the definition of the Fermat number. And notice it's got a plus one in there. So this minus one will cancel that plus one, just leaving us with two to the two to the k plus one quantity squared plus one. But then if you multiply two, but then if you square something like that, that means you need to multiply the exponent that you've got right there. And anyway, what you're left with is two to the two to the k plus two plus one, which is the k plus second Fermat number. And now let's make sure we've got it. So let's read this thing right here and this thing right here. And let's notice if we were to swap the direction of the equality, it would match our goal where n is replaced with k plus one. But that's exactly what we need it to do to finish the induction step and, this, and thus finish the proof of this second lemma. And now we're ready to prove the main result of this video, which is the n plus first prime number is less than or equal to the nth Fermat number. And we're gonna proceed by induction again, and this is gonna go really quickly with our setup. And we're gonna proceed by induction again, this time strong induction. And this is gonna go really fast given our setup. Okay, so let's start with a base case. And so our base case will be the case when n is equal to zero. Well, really, and thus, n plus one is equal to one. So let's notice that p sub one, the first prime number, is equal to two. Okay, but if there's anything I know, it's that two is definitely less than three. It's in fact equal to three minus one. Okay, but then we can rewrite three as two plus one. But then that's the same thing as two to the one, but then we can write, rewrite that exponent up there as two to the zero. But now that's exactly the zeroth Fermat number. And now if we read this from here with all of these underlines, we definitely have it. Okay, so now let's make our induction step. But like I said, we're gonna do a strong induction step. So it's gonna go like this. Let's suppose for all m between zero and k, the result holds. So in other words, we have 
P sub M plus one is less than or equal to F sub M. Okay, nice. So notice we're assuming a lot of things here. We're assuming that P sub one is less than F sub zero, P sub two is less than F sub three, so on and so forth, all the way up to this last one right here where P sub K plus one is less than or equal to F sub K. Okay, but now let's get at it. So now P sub K plus two, which is the first case not covered by our induction hypothesis, I mean, this looks like a little bit weird here, but when you plug K into the index, you get P sub K plus one. So the P sub K plus one case is covered. This is the first one that is not covered. So now that's gonna be less than or equal to, well, an object like this using our first lemma. So we've got P sub one times P sub two ending at P sub K plus one plus one. But now we can apply our induction hypothesis to every term here, and that's gonna give us something less than or equal to F sub zero times F sub one all the way up to F sub K plus one. But now we can use this result over here, but now we can use this result over here if it's solved for the product. So this will be equal to F sub K plus one minus two plus one. Okay, and just to reiterate, what I did is I took this product and I rewrote it like that, those in the green parentheses, and that's using our lemma two over here. Okay, but then that simplifies to F sub K plus one minus one, which is strictly less than F sub K plus one. But now reading this from the extreme left to right hand side, you'll see that we've done it. Okay, so I hope you liked the video. If you're still here and you haven't subscribed yet, maybe think about subscribing. And also I've done other videos on the channel on prime numbers, the infinitude of primes of certain types or just in general. There should be one of those on the screen right now if you'd like to check it out. And that's a good place to stop.